Hello, uh, we are Team 4, and our project, uh, Topics of Interest, is Robotics in the Military. Uh, I'm Trevor, this is James, and this is Jonathan, and we will begin our presentation. I'm going to hand it off to James for the background of, the, of military robots. So just a quick uh, background of military robots. The first military robot ever produced was the radio boat as pictured here. And it was invented in 1898 by a man named by the, a man named Nikola Tesla. And he originally offered the US Navy and the United Kingdom his invention. However, the, the countries both declined his offer because at the time it was too complex and they just did not understand it at that and understand radio technology at that time. So, however, later on though, in World War II, Russia and Germany used them for surveillance. So, that first initial, that first initial radio robot eventually led to um, other applications such as um, the Soviet Union used teletanks that were also controlled by, um, by radio control. And they would range from a distance of up to 500 to 1500 meters, depending on weather and terrain. And the, uh, as far as the Germans are concerned, the Germans used a controlled landmine, which would be uh, radio, radio controlled to go about 500 to 1500 meters, meters to its intended target and blow up. However, they decided to stop using them and they only produced maybe about 7,000 during during World War II due to the fact that they only were one use and they were very expensive to produce. So essentially they were just throwing away money every time they decided to uh, hit a target. Now back to, um, to Trevor to go over the Dragonfire 2. Okay, great. So more a continuation of the background of military robots, the Dragonfire 2 is a mortar system that basically is a, pretty, is a transportable mortar uh, system where it is capable of being able to fire mortars 14 seconds apart from each other. So that's an incredible capability right there. It also uses a GPS and canard basically. Its firing system is really able to lock onto its location and that technology is just really great for um, being able to protect civilian lives. That would be, they can really focus on getting uh, people you know, in, in question and you know, take them out without hurting anybody else. Um, another uh, technology used um, nowadays is called the PathBot. It's a small rover that is able to detect and search for IEDs along the road. This really helped in the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars uh, because they're all over the war zone that was littered with eight IEDs. Um, improvised explosive devices, and these robots were able to go and infiltrate an area that could have had one, and it was able to take it apart or dismantle or explode it if, if needed, without injuring any soldiers' lives, uh, affecting any soldiers' lives. So another um, really awesome technology, it's the exoskeleton suit. It's basically an Iron Man suit, just not as complex. It helps with um, increasing the strength of a human artificially, um, using you know all kinds of arms and and, um, uh, and motors and, and different things to just augment the strength of human. Now, this is a recently it's been recently pioneered. It hasn't been around for a while, so this technology is always you know there are a lot of research is going into this technology to further advance the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the technology. And um, we're going to be talking about more um, systems in the coming slides. So here is a, another example of an exoskeleton robot that is, has been produced today by a Lockheed Martin. And it's designed for workers that handle loads of more than 30, 30 pounds or more. So for example, in the Navy, a lot of the equipment and a lot of the tools that they use when, when operating machinery or fixing any particular problems around, around their vessel, oftentimes they're using very heavy, very heavy tools of in excess of 30 pounds or more. So this uh, particular exoskeleton is designed to take most of that load off of them 
so that they are not burnt out too soon. And this actually will allow them to be more productive, more efficient, and last longer, and not put such a strain on their body as well. And it also has a feature in which the feet will sit firmly on the ground so that the terrain, so that they can feel um, their, their terrain more, more normal, more, um, more naturally, as well as if they needed to climb a lot, something like a ladder or go through something, uh, some, one of an uneven surface, they're, they're capable of doing so as well. So next we have the Hulk. This one, as opposed to the Fortis, which was designed for stove workers, is designed for soldiers uh, who need to carry up to as much as 200 pounds. Um, in the battlefield, as you can imagine, you know the terrain is not always flat, and so they have to be able to squat and crawl, which the Hulk is capable of allowing soldiers to do. Uh, it transfers a, a load uh, to, directly to the ground and not to the soldiers, so that way the soldier does not get any of the load to the to him or her. And lastly, uh, it adjusts uh, from 5'4 to 6'2, uh, giving different heights uh, of soldiers uh, an opportunity to wear the Hulk. Also, the entire suit is operated under lithium polymer batteries. As you can see here in the back, uh, it has the, the battery pack in it, so that way it's the, the entire suit is capable of moving. So up and coming, we have what's called a Talos. It's a, a new exoskeleton, exoskeleton uh, design. Um, it has a revolutionary uh, features, such as a liquid body armor. This type of defensive mechanism allows any sort of penetration to just not even happen. The moment of, upon contact, it hardens. So not only does a soldier have flexibility of movement, it is in, incredibly defensive, allowing the soldier, of course, to maintain, you know, stay alive. Um, it also has a feature that allows it to check vitals, which is obviously very important in the battlefield, you know, if a soldier to get hurt or anything, not only will it be known amongst the suit, it will send out signals to other soldiers and to uh, their side, so that way they know that they're okay or if they're not okay. And uh, it is powered by a battery, which is also supp supplemented by a small engine. So not only are these um, power-hungry mechanisms inside the suit use electricity, there's an engine that constantly refills its electricity, so that way it's always going. So this is the next upcoming design in a few years. Um, with the Talos, will be, it will be capable of limiting civilian casualties. Um, the liquid armor allows soldiers to enter rescue operation much safely, as you can imagine, you know, there's another enemy on the side, they're probably very, uh, you know, nervous as to what's happening, so it eliminates that kind of uh, threat. Um, if they're, they're similar, there'll be moments when they have an additional party member, such as a civilian, that they might have to let the guard down to maybe calm them down or to put them somewhere safe, which will, you know, pose a threat to the soldier, but with the tailor suit, they will be perfectly uh, safe and from harm. Um, civilians themselves occasionally will pose a threat, whether to the soldiers or someone else. So I should imagine the, the soldier will have to, to stop the threat. Normally they'll have to eliminate the uh, civilian. However, with the tailors, they don't have to necessarily do that right away. They have the opportunity to train them since they'll also be safe uh, as a soldier. Uh, lastly, Trevor will come in to finish up the presentation. Okay. So I'm just gonna summarize a quick conclusion of everything we've talked about. Um, basically, we understand that there's a lot of benefits that come from robotics, especially in the military. And, and enormous breakthroughs have been um, occurring all throughout uh, time as far as this, uh, this is concerned. So we just have to understand something very quickly, how the development of robotics and automatic weaponry, although this has caused destruction in the past, we can bring it back to World War II where a lot of human lives were lost because of these automatic weaponry. The paradox is through the continued research and technology uh, into the technology, we can also save human lives. We can also uh, figure out ways how to uh, mitigate these, uh, these things that happen. You know, when the enemy wants to you know, take somebody out, we have the technology to be able to stop them and on top of that protect human lives as with um, 
better firing systems, more accurately um, uh, taking out the enemy. We have the exoskeletons to help us improve our efficiency in the war zone, and etc. many other things. So we also understand that robotics have a huge impact in daily life. And we understand that the technology that goes into um, robotics in the military can also trickle down into our daily lives where one day perhaps we could have exoskeleton suits that help us with you know, doing work in the, uh, you know, in, in the industry. Perhaps you work at a Walmart and you have to lift a heavy box, you can perhaps have one of these suits and it will help you do your daily tasks and just work more efficiently. And we just see these things becoming uh, really, really awesome in the future. And this is uh, that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you.